Bonjour à tous. Well, hello, everyone. I, first of all, would like to extend my thanks to the organizers of this uh, uh, study days for inviting me to tackle questions that have been there to me for a long time. I'd like to extend my thanks to Marc Fermin for uh, accepting to take care of uh, simultaneously interpreting my words in, from French into English, as uh, you've pointed out. Indeed, I, uh, um, I'm an associate member at Princeton University. I could have delivered this presentation in uh, uh, English, but um, I'd like to deliver this uh, presentation in my mother tongue. And I'd like to remain, make sure um, for my words to be precise, to uh, prevent any misunderstanding, I will address you in French language. So, I want to tell you that I'm truly happy uh, looking at the interest uh, from part of the AUP um, with regards to studies on uh, hatred, hatred speech for many years now. As a result of my research work in France, this uh, 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 issue is often played down. And uh, really, uh, we have to renew interest in this, um, in such subject matters. And that is why I uh, wrote this uh, book, which you've mentioned, on the venom, um, a, it depends whether this is about uh, anti Semitism, a discourse uh, in the French cultural context, but I'm approaching this as social historian, which is a dual specificity in some ways because I'm both a historian and a sociologist. So hence the significance uh, of these two dimensions in my approaches and um, particular regards to sociology. Now, I wanted to tell you a few words before getting into the heart of the matter today on my latest uh, um, a book which I co-authored with the sociologist Stéphane Beau, entitled Race et Sciences Sociales, because this focuses around a theme that we are uh, we have dealing with, uh, narrating um, hate, uh, what I discourse categories in the construction of uh, individual and collective identities. So I've, I've recently offered this book focusing on controversies and I have many such controversies in France uh, on focusing on race, racial, racialized, racialization, uh, standing aside from the controversies, showing how we can use uh, the tools that social sciences avail ourselves with to clarify what's at stake. And this brings me to clarify one thing on the, um, the angle of my own research because throughout my career I worked on three major issues. The first one uh, concerns the socio history of the working classes. This is about working on the um, uh, working class and um, this is the history of France which I wrote uh, really focuses on this and the second one, the, uh, the second major issues which I've uh, worked on is immigration and anti-Semitism and, uh, and racism. And the third one is centered on intellectuals, uh, those that I call professionals of the public word. This is a vision of intellectuals in a very wide um, sense of the uh, terms. Uh, these are the people who as a result of their professions speak in public and in these categories you find ex you'll find experts politicians journalists academics so i'm including myself in this group so to maybe help you understand these areas of research of mine the, the, you need to understand that these three areas are linked together by a common thread which consists in analyzing what pierre bourdieu the sociologist uh, um, I worked with at the start of my career, uh, what Pierre Bourdieu called the symbolic power. Why? Because it brings us to the another notion referred to as uh, symbolic violence. So violence is not limited to physical violence. I think we are 
with the, the rapid changes of our democracies and technologies and what we've been doing today with the remote when we have hold remote um, um, uh, sessions uh, we have you know violent speech can trigger violent action so this is about articulating violence physical violence and symbolic violence and this symbolic violence is a consequence uh, of the uh, uh, public addresses of those who are referred to as the uh, intellectuals uh, uh, and who those who carry the public word so this is about self-criticism as well i try to analyze the impact of what i can say or today in the public um, space and this is about what you know on in behalf of what or why uh, you know we have to, or we speak on behalf of others or in lieu of others, in the, in the, in the place of others. So I've been a committed citizen and an anti-racist activist for over 40 years. So I know that I have this privilege of speaking in public as I do today. And this is a matter of, you know, uh, you know this is a very notion of, uh, which I've focused a lot on with sociologists and researchers in social psychology, uh, on these um, aspects now, what moving forward now, what I refer to as the symbolic violence, one of these modes, the obvious uh, uh, maybe size is what uh, I refer to the capacity that uh, some can tell others, you are this or you are that. So I focus a lot on these. Uh, um, and how this articulates in my works on uh, immigration, how we, um, you know, what vocabularies we use to name the others, uh, to uh, maybe uh, maybe name categories that are then classified by law, by administrations. We will then ask citizens to identify, okay, you are this or you are that, or you are not this or you are not that. So my reflection on this is ab about all of these social groups, not only migrants, people from outside of the borders of France, or those who have been stigmatized. And in, I started my first research works on the spokespersons and the impacts on the communist parties and the trade unions. This is where I started. And uh, when you had, uh, maybe people speaking on behalf of the working class in the name of the working class. And um, when you had such leaders, notably the French communist parties, and, um, and what impact did it have? So these uh, issues in, in race and social sciences, I've analyzed the same kind of problems in relation to race and for maybe, and, and this, raised a number of uh, eyebrows and but this is about taking taking a step back to clarify political stakes and so this brings me to a very important dimension in my view as i mentioned earlier as a commit as a, a, a committed researcher and this is about defining the uh, civic and the purpose of science Mark no, I, I've often referred to uh, this uh, master of thoughts, historian of the 18th century. This is about the social function of history. And I believe, I'm a very strong believer in the fact that the role of academics is not to, to delegitimize or support such and such a political cause, even if they are committed to this cause. But this is about taking a step back uh, and maybe this, this, we're talking moons ago, and that Stalinism, when I was a student, I often uh, support, uh, I often saw um, uh, maybe opinions that had dramatic effects in real life indeed. So I think that the best thing we could do as a committed researcher in the field of social sciences was uh, by and large what Tony Morrison 
the uh, Literature Nobel uh, Prize uh, awardee. What he said about literature was uh, that um, he defined literature as the disidentification, the emancipation, the autonomy. Uh, and, uh, so vis-a-vis -vis those who, uh, put, well, who say that they speak on um, our own behalf. So I'd like to um, notably in particular um, refer you to Voir qu'on mon ne voit jamais, dialogue between Pierre Bourdieu and Toni Morrison and Vacarme. So this is a type of reflections that, that committed researchers are required to, uh, to develop. This was a kind of a paralysis, a preamble that I wanted to share with you before getting into the, the, the heart of uh, my presentation today. This is about the symbolic power and the symbolic violence is very, very present uh, in the book, which I focus the venin dans la plume, the rhetoric. Uh, and, you know, which I call it the rhetoric of hate. And we, we need to start defining what rhetoric means, because as you know, the word rhetoric re refers to dimension of discourse. That is about the art of convincing an audience. So i.e. how these polemicists, these journalists, uh, these politicians, these populists uh, go about convincing their audience. Uh, it's very important in France because today we're seeing not only in France, you know, well, uh, Donald Trump and uh, but in, in France as well, in many other countries, you have people who manage to convince many, many citizens, uh, although their discourses are absurd uh, from the rational standpoint and they are dangerous from a civil standpoint. So we need to analyze these rhetorics, we need to analyze the mechanism that leads to these beliefs. And this is what brought me to focus on the reception of the uh, discourse, not only the analysis of the speech and the speech itself, but how um, these discourses are, um, are received so that people believe in their content. This is what uh, I, uh, many of my colleagues have worked on anti-Semitism and, uh, and, and out in their analysis, their speech analysis will be absolutely brilliant, but it will not focus, uh, they will not focus on the on how these discourses are received and why. And if um, you don't focus on the, re uh, the reception of discourses, you tend to impose a meaning. This is your meaning, your, the meaning you want to give and not the, that of the readers that will hear or read those discourses. And this brought me to study uh, and to develop on the various strategies that historians have, have put in place um, and uh, to interpret the, uh, and the uh, discourses, uh, be it for in terms of their um, you know, to convince, you know, this is about understanding the strategies that speech writers use to convince their audiences, take into account their social characteristics, their origin, gender, nationality, social class, personal history. So in my conclusion, when I, as you will see, when I look at solutions that we can put in place when it comes to hate speech, and um, we're looking at people who can, uh, you know, how we can uh, take action, how we can react, how we can engage our uh, emotional resources. And maybe as academics, we are trained to analyze texts and not only, and not necessarily to understand the role of emotions in the meaning of the words of speeches. So as I, I said earlier in my book, Le Venin dans la Plume, published in uh, La Découverte in 2019, I compared the writings of the polemicist Edouard Remont, a journalist who played a key role in France in the spread of anti-Semitism at the end of the 19th century, and those of the polemicist Eric Zemmour, a journalist who has been convicted several times in recent years for incitement to hatred against Muslims, and I've referred to, 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 in my, to this in my book, 
as Islamophobia. For a non French speaking audience, this might come across as strange, but in France, there's been a whole a controversy, a serious controversy going on around the word Islamophobia. There's a, a, a school of thoughts that uh, this community discussion saying, well, a researcher did not have the right to use uh, this term Islamophobia. Why? Because terrorists claim to be radical Islam and use Islamophobia to justify their criminal acts. So the claim was claiming to be Islamic. Now, you can't use this term because if you do use this term, you, uh, you will also um, uh, uh, this will further strengthen the uh, position of terrorist groups. Uh, well, in that case, uh, you know, the, this um, anti-Semitism, well, is a term that uh, uh, brought within uh, as uh, a backdrop to um, controversies. Uh, so, you, so you can't say, well, you're going to be advocating such and such course by using a term because I've used words in, and we've seen this happening. Uh, academics use words, different meanings, but to claim autonomy, we need to define the words that we use scientifically in a scientific sense, but we cannot you not use a term of the common vocabulary um, for hate speech and um, significant hate speech, no, these is against Muslims. So we have to, I think it is legitimate for us to use it, but on the condition that it is rigorously defined. Now comes to the comparison between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And this really, I'm focusing back on the uh, this conference. So it is not, of course, a matter of equating the historical atrocities that led to the genocide of the Jews with discrimination that Muslims in France uh, suffering today. My argument is really centered on the writings of the of a comparison of the speeches and centering on the writings of the uh, the founder of anti-Semitism in France, Edouard Drummond, this journalist and polemicist of the end of the uh, 19th century. When and in those days, the French were playing down anti-Semitism. I'm just quoting a, a text, if, uh, a contemporary news uh, text. And really, we can see when we do that, we can see that uh, anti-Semitism was not taken seriously. So I'm comparing the, the, this, the works of Edouard Drummond with those published by another polemicist and journalist called Eric Zemmour, uh, saying both differences, but most importantly, the common points between the two. So what struck me and uh, in, in prior uh, of research I carried out uh, before this uh, step, how can we define the birth of anti-Semitism and the, 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 the hate of or Jews? Uh, the, 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 hatred for Jews. Uh, in, in this and the um, uh, religious discourses uh, um, against the Jews. So, so we know that uh, there, there was indeed uh, I mean, a rejection of uh, the Jews, but this became to be politicized at the end of the 19th century. And that is interesting because uh, it, it is all the most interesting to say this for France, because then France had just become a democratic state. Uh, so if you, if, if you know about uh, history of France, uh, the fall of the Second Empire in 1870, after the defeat against Germany, led to the Third Republic. And along with it came long institutions that are uh, well, democratic institutions, and we still have under these institutions at this point in time in France. And so that, uh, that is what struck me. Uh, so Republican France is, 
uh, is considering itself, and maybe it is or it was then the most advanced democracy in the world. Uh, it is in this context uh, that anti Semitism as a political current uh, uh, came about, which led to the uh, Vichy government, racial laws, and collaboration with Nazis and ex uh, extermination of the Jews. So we need to deep dive into these issues to attempt to, to understand these. So the French at the time, the uh, founders of the Third Republic were very proud to say that uh, France had become a democratic country in contrast to Russia, which persecuted Jews and um, carrying out programs. Uh, and uh, it was uh, against Jews and uh, in the United States, meanwhile, which lynched uh, blacks and pogroms and lynching are Russian and American words that were introduced into the French language at that time. And uh, so this Republican France of the end of the 19th century is also France that and, um, and received uh, Russian Jews who were fleeing from pogroms and African as well as African-American artists fleeing racial segregation. As you can see, there's a kind of a, a tension between two uh, kinds of France, two facets of France, two contradictory facets, because this is also the start of the mass immigration, the uh, building of the Republican colonial empires. So it is, uh, I think it is extremely interesting to analyze this period as a result of this contrast. So when I, Talking about Edouard Remond uh, and the, lo the, 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 the film that the, 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 the book that launched uh, anti Semitism was the, the, the great bestseller of the um, Third Republic. It was published on a number of occasions at the start, and no one wanted to publish it, so it is a mystery. At the start, no, no publisher wanted to publish it, so Edouard Remond used his own money to publish it and so how did it come how did this book become a uh, bestseller and the same question could be uh, asked about uh, eric zemmour is uh, his books uh, are, have come on thread theme uh, i.e uh, hatred against muslims uh, is uh, sold 300,000, 500,000 copies of these. And it, people are saying that he might be a candidate for the next uh, presidential elections. So this is worthy of a comparison with uh, his predecessor. And um, so what did Edouard Remond invent? In what way can be considered as the founder of the rhetoric of hate speech that can be found up to today in people like Zemmour. My hypothesis is that anti-Semitism or today's Islamophobia are pathologies of democracy. Yeah, uh, perverse effects of democracies. These are not necessarily contradictions with democracy. These are uh, social diseases, social perversions triggered, caused by the democratic system and by capitalism. And that is why I'd like to demonstrate to you briefly now. Why am I insisting on this? Because these uh, hate speech, which I'll focus on, uh, produced in democratic societies, they're very different from the totalitarian speech based on um, uh, on um, force, because it must convince its audience by peaceful means. And in the state, power depends on the belief. You need to convince your voters to vote for you to buy your paper. So rhetoric has an extremely important role to play because we are in a society when you, you need to impose your views by peaceful means. So in the French case, the, the Third Republic is, well, the start of the Third Republic, it is a pivotal moment because within a matter of a few years with Jules Ferry, 
Then there was the, the, the main laws that are still govern to this day, which were then voted freedom, political freedom from a parliamentarian standpoint, the flourishing of the uh, political life, the freedom of the press, the 1881 law, and which will result in a significant uh, uh, growth of the, the mass press because the working classes were up until then excluded from participating in public life were then included in the public space because from that point on all the French, all the people in France read or read, um, read the papers uh, from one to 10 million readers within a matter of years. It was a tremendous change in the uh, regime. Uh, hence, uh, the significant role of journalists in the form that public debate took in the choice of the issues that made the headlines, uh, the, what we call the news, and as well as in a, a different dimension that is often underestimated, which is about the journalistic style, narrating stories, journalists will to, to impact a popular audience uh, that maybe is not equipped or has not got the, the education to uh, read abstract or complicated uh, content. The, this is about constructing in narration. So with uh, the goodies, the buddies, uh, the victims, uh, the assassins. So this is all this rhetoric that uh, uh, was then uh, uh, that's, that came about then. So the public space becomes or is turned into a theater animated by actors who are the representatives of the people. So we have this, this mod, modus operandi that uh, comes about. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, another phenomenon uh, came about, which was about uh, the first great crisis of capitalism and uh, during this, the, the same period uh, in the 1880s. Uh, and this uh, was a European-wide uh, crisis, but France was uh, particularly badly hit, which I've referred to in one of my previous books because it destroyed the small business uh, the, and the uh, large industries, the heavy industries triumphed came on top uh, and uh, this uh, uh, was the birth of the Marxist uh, working class movement uh, uh, with this discourse focused on uh, the, um, the class struggle. This revolutionary speech uh, concerned the capitalists and therefore the strategy put in place by the dominant class tried uh, to counter the Marxist discourse and this favored those um, xenophobic or anti-Semitic and um, discourse um, peddlers. And these uh, really um, resulted in a crisis of the parliamentarian um, uh, system. It, it was hardly put in place. It had just been uh, put in place and it was uh, challenged right away as early as the 1880s, because popular classes rejected democracy because politicians uh, could not find a solution to the crisis. So all of this generated a context that favored, uh, that encouraged hate speech. Uh, we find this in the 1930s and in recent uh, time when a very powerful social crisis hits. And hate speech can be successful because people are in disarray and they are displaced. And this motivates the resentment, uh, and this is fertile grounds for hate speech. So all this was a context uh, that we must understood uh, to understand the great response to Edouard Drummond's France Juive. So Drummond, when you need to understand, is that this uh, individual hailed from working class. Uh, backgrounds and he took advantage of opportunities uh, offered by the uh, growing number of journalists of the journalistic profession to 
uh, a developing career and he uh, found a job with uh, the jo the uh, newspapers of the uh, uh, Catholic rights, uh, Republic Francaise really is about the secular state, the separation of the, um, the state and the church. So what Drummond managed to understand, and this is, uh, let us not underestimate uh, uh, the um, polemicists and the far right uh, polemicists, uh, they have a situational um, specific intelligence, they understand the context. So to convince his audience, Drummond decided that it, was, it did not suffice to, uh, um, to narrate uh, uh, events. You need to uh, narrate, to put these, uh, to integrate them into the identity narrative. As I said earlier, the mass press will, or integrated will capture the popular audience, will draw the attention of the popular audience around big narratives. So us, the French, and them, the foreigners. It is the very basis of the mass press in terms of journalistic speech. Obviously, we have the far right press, but I'm talking about the, the uh, uh, mainstream press, the equivalent of the central radio or TV channels. People who uh, purport to be neutral, but they actually construct an ideological discourse built on an identity uh, division which centered around the us French and the them foreigners principle. So Drummond can be labeled an anti-Semitist and Zemmour uh, as an Islamophobist or Islamophobic. Um, but the nationalism remains a very powerful argument to convince people in France and beyond the borders of France. So Drummond relies on this them or us French. We are the victims of them, the Germans who wage war against us now. But because it's part of the Catholic right uh, combating Republicans, he will give a religious spin to his speech, uh, connecting, uh, making the link between the Germans and the Jews. So the stereotype uh, was that of the German Jew it was a founding figure of the foreign year. We, the French, are victims of these German, German Jews who threaten us still. So Drummond prepared, uh, laid the ground to what then became the Dreyfus Affairs a few years later. So uh, this uh, affair came about a few years after Drummond constructed his narrative. He was presented as a German Jew because he came, he came from Alsace. So, and he was presented as a German Jew. This is a practical translation of ideological speeches or discourses of Edouard Drummond. So here is an identity driven dimension, this uh, identity dimension, what is identity about? Well, this is about the us against the others. We need to distinguish, to, to make a difference between, you know, to, to make the split between us and them. But a second dimension, this identity discourse is historical. And this is about saying we have a memory. We are the same today uh, from when we were as when we were born. And this is about, we, the French, are Christian and we've always been persecuted by the Jews. And this is also this whole discourse on the Jews who crucified Jesus. So this is the, the rambling of prejudiced and Catholic uh, preconceived ideas that are recycled in the political speech because Drummond um, uh, sit down with the Jews. His discourse really is a political, there's an pol underlying political program. We need to eliminate the Jews that threat, who threatened the poor French. So threat, in the case of Drummond, is embodied by fi the finance. He's making the link between um, 
capitalism, and we'll see this with Zemmour Sodrumon, purports to be an anti capitalist activist. For him, this is embodied by Rothschild family. So Jews are bankers and uh, and they are threatening us, and this is in the content, context of an economic crisis that this happens. When we have a, um, well, Drummond accuses Rothschild of being responsible for the uh, bankruptcy of the crisis that ensued. Now, Drummond, to convince his audience, uh, purports to be a scientist and uh, you, to convince your audience, you need to purport to be a, a scientist, a researcher, and a scholar. So he presented himself as a true scholar. He, and, and you had this, and uh, well, the whole rhetoric you can, about racial researchers, but Drummond will uh, connect his anti Semitic uh, discourse to. The discourse developed by a number of linguists like Renan on uh, opposing Aryan races and uh, Semitic races. So you have the Semites and you have the Aryans. So this is kind of a race struggle. This is a kind of a, what he purported to be a uh, scholarly uh, discourse, what he tried to. Uh, to um, narrate to his uh, audience, and he connected it to something that has nothing to do with uh, scholarly principles. And this one is about uh, uh, the uh, diversion of uh, politics. So the trend and which worsened significantly today is to give more and more room to, um, uh, well, um, let's say miscellaneous events, a crime, let's say you take and this, a, uh, a criminal, a victim, and a, a and the police. This is a matrix. And so let us realize that when they talk about crimes uh, in their papers, um, well, the readership um, uh, gets larger and larger because uh, they want for the uh, culprits to be denounced, to be found, and so on. So, and these, and, um, and miscellaneous events will become larger and larger, and political life itself will be seen in the angle of the uh, criminals, the victims, uh, the police, uh, the aggressors. And and so Drummond nurtured this, and uh, whenever he wanted to denounce uh, the Jews, he um, accused them of being involved in a crime directly or indirectly, and this impacted the public because everybody knows about miscellaneous events, crimes, and this is, you know, given a very large space. So he, he used the common sense contracted by the media, the mainstream media, by the fact that, uh, okay, they are really uh, leading, what's leading the news are, uh, and who, um, those leading the news are uh, journalists, but I then like to focus on uh, what we refer to uh, in French as le grand remplacement, the great replacement. What he succeeded, Dumont succeeded in imposing this theme. Oh, this is about saying you know, us, white race, us, the French, us, uh, Westerners, uh, we are going to vanish from the surface of the, the, the earth, because we're going to be replaced by all these barbarians, criminals uh, coming from, that come from abroad. And this is found in Dumont's works, except that he could not really use this argument vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Jews, because there were very few French and uh, very few Jews in French society at the time, about 80,000 of them. Uh, except Drummond said, yes, there are very few, but they are at the top of the social scale, at the social ladder, at the top of the social ladder. This is a great replacement at the top of the banks, at the top of the state. Uh, and he accused all the parliamentarians, ministers, and of being Jews. And at the top of the press, they uh, control over all the papers, and we can't say anything. We are muzzled. And, uh, and he, uh, succeeded in imposing these themes in his rhetoric. And this is what we call the, this leads to the rhetoric of the inversion. This consists in 
presenting the victims have as culprits and dominated as dominating so so the uh, the minorities hold the power so they purport to be persecuted uh, victims but are not and they want us to believe that they are the victims but are not and this is what we'll see on the Zimor side of our analysis now and this leads to a significantly important element which is about the prophetic dimension of a discourse the polemicist conveying hate speech is a prophet he announces a catastrophe he's a, he announces is the bearer of a this uh, of a, this he's spelling disaster so if we don't do anything about about the jews against the jews we are going to disappear we're going to be destroyed and this impacts people especially in economic crisis because people are in disarray they're anguished and they're given a perspective uh, read and read from that point and we can see the emotional dimension which is extremely strong extremely impactful and a final point because that's the kind of the the rhetoric in itself as i observed is by analyzing drummond's work but it doesn't explain in itself the this uh, dissemination of his books is uh, how uh, you know how can you explain the vast uh, dissemination of his works in france but i think i've found an answer maybe not the only one but is uh, and that relates to the fact that uh, Dumont and um, premises like him are extremely relevant i'd say in how scandals are manufactured in democratic societies uh, uh, rested upon uh, the freedom of the press and freedom of speech uh, while well, scandal is key because that creates notoriety that get, that drives uh, that draws the attention of the public uh, and Drummond understood this and uh, uh, and uh, Drummond is, is books is a uh, is a sequence a change of in of abuse uh, every other page you find abuses and which is quite striking when you on the third uh during the third republic and especially men and the masculine identity was insulted the way of defending these back then was to have a duo using a sword or using pistols at bois de boulogne and bois de vincennes in paris in paris is and I think there were tens and tens of um, uh, a duo. And um, the press would catch these stories and would speak about these. And Drummond was very much involved in these duels. So the first duel, uh, Drummond was wounded by Edouard Meillard, Meyer, the, the director of uh, a royalist paper. And uh, when Le Mans, uh, was wounded, got wounded by Meyer. He turned to the journalist there, saying, "Well, as you, you can see, that a Jew killed a Christian. So there's a staging, a spectacular staging, uh, relayed by all of the papers that fed anti-Semitism in France, and of course, German's book uh, was well." Uh, you know, um, was only disseminated to a few hundred copies. This became a bestseller. Drummond had self published this book, but it uh, spread like wildfire and obviously this impacted and pervaded through theater, literature, political life from this starting point. So it's quite fascinating to see how this issue was able to, to, to spread. Uh, or these it doesn't matter the french became anti-semitic or it's, it's just that drummond founded an anti-semitic party uh, which only had marginal influence and then uh, drummond was himself uh, became a deputy and he was not re-elected uh, but it created a current of thought and what i think that what matters most in drummond's success is not that he convinced every french to become anti-Semitic, but he created 
the belief that there was a Jewish problem, the notion of Jewish problem came about. And when you instill in people's mind that, that there is, that someone is a problem, uh, you can, depending on the circumstance, you can reactivate this, this course. And this is what happened in France. And then it was uh, the First World War came about in the 20s, the French uh, economy picked up. And uh, so it, Jumon's theories uh, were marginalized. But then uh, with the crisis in the um, late 20s, early 30s, this is what led to the collaboration with um, uh, the Nazi regime and with the Vichy and the horrors of the Vichy government. Uh, so I'd like to move on to the second part of my presentation with a focus on Eric Zemmour. As I mentioned earlier, I think that the government put in place the rules of an, of a, an, an identity driven grammar. So uh, it means that rules can be stated and, so, and interpreted in so many different ways. And this underpins the language. And here, We've got the same principles. You have rules underpinning the different uh, hate speeches, and amongst those, there's the one that Eric Zemmour is disseminating, which is adapted to the demands of our time. What struck me when I read uh, his works, Eric uh, Zemmour's work, it, I spent a long time to, to do my job. Um, uh, seriously, uh, I was struck. The number of uh, similarities with uh, Drummond's rhetoric. And the Eric Zemmour uh, texts are far less insulting than those of uh, Drummond's, because it's no longer possible to, in France to sustain such uh, insulting words because there are laws against racism. You need to be cautious then. You need to relay your speech in a more um, in a more euphemistic manner. But we find basically the same principles. So the first element of comparison, that's a uh, social trajectory. Eric Zemmour hails from a modest uh, uh, social class, and he uh, imposed himself in the French public space thanks to the new opportunities uh, uh, driven by the communication revolution that we've seen over the past 15, 20 years, which is about the combination of the 24 news channels and the eruption or the growth of or the surge of social networks. So this explains in my understanding, not only in France, but around the world, the development of the new discourses, nationalistic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, racist discourses that spread, um, engaging with all this new means of, or outlets of communications. In Zemmour's speech, we have the identity driven logic. This is always the us French under threat, but except that the mortal enemy is no longer the Jew, but the Muslim. So Zemmour based uh, his uh, uh, speech on um, um, criminal uh, or terror attacks uh, the, uh, perpetrated that by um, and, and, um, terrorists claiming to be Muslims. But again, he really is these uh, terrorist attacks uh, carried out by a family, very limited number of individuals. And Zimou, in Zimou, we find this historical dimensions, which I was referring to earlier. The French identity, for, in his view, is about the French, the historical identity. And uh, the Christians, um, according to Zimou, have always been in conflict with Islam. Hence his observed references of the history of France on the uh, Poitiers battle in uh, 632. He presented uh, Francois the Third, Francis the Third, as a traitor uh, because it signed a pact with Sultan Soliman the Magnificent. This is about such historical nonsense. Uh, his analysis, but it nurtures, nevertheless, his identity-driven uh, discourse uh, with a view to rejecting the Muslims. And obviously, 
when serious historians like many of my colleagues we come into the discussion and said well this is groundless this is baseless and the answer is that we are enemies from within we are party to the foreigners who threatening us so this is a this is what Eric Zemmour called the Islamo leftist I think there's a currently a, a controversy because the Minister of Higher Education used the Zemmourian expression and when we read Zemmour see that Islamo leftist means that those fighting against uh, Islamophobia and racism are regarded as traitor at the service of the terrorist history is extremely serious and this is why uh, i mean what shocked me most is what what was really a new trace is that to see that when Simon wrote his book he denounced the the work of historians he said well we are a kind of a mafia the service of the enemies of france and he eric Zemmour appeared on many many tv channels and um, published and uh, in many many papers and he said this and at no point was he told well you are over the top here this is a kind of anti-intellectualism then uh, forming the basis of populist because when you try to prove something which is based on our job you're accused of being a traitor and uh, maybe uh, and uh, useful idiots and uh, all of these expressions came about in this course and we need to be very critical of them so moving along in my presentation what i forgot to uh, point out or Drummond, what we find with Zemmour again is that the Drummond uh, anti-semitism and uh, islamophobia or Zemmour is uh, part of a wider speech uh, often um, Drummond would uh, criticize uh, feminism as uh, Zemmour denounces the gay lobby and obviously uh, and uh, attacking anti racist and uh, feminist organizations. So the hate speech is focused in one case on the Jews and on the other, in the other on Muslims. It's part of a global rhetoric, reactionary rhetoric that is extremely powerful. And here again, what can be found with Zemmour is the apocalyptic of prophetism. It is the, the, the idea, or underpinned by the idea, is that if we don't do anything against Islam, and well, France will go down the drain. So we need to engage, we need to do something about this, and a number of um, public address and uh, to really take action if he doesn't say like that like it is because it could, it could be con uh, condemned by um, justice uh, but they are incitement to shift from speech to action to eliminate uh, the enemies so i won't have enough time to to dwell upon this because uh, time is is running out but uh, I'd, I'd like to refer you to my my book. I analyzed the how, the how these discourses from Drummond Zemmour were perceived in the public. On Drummond, I won't refer to this. It's a bit more complicated because we we don't have that many archives. But for um, Zemmour, I looked at the social media and I looked at how. Uh, the followers of Zemmour, those who read his book, who believe in what he says, how this could uh, interpret what Zemmour would say when on the news or when on TV. So this, this is quite interesting because I think we would need to deep dive into this dimension. And uh, even when so Zemmour has been uh, handed down a few, uh, on a few occasions, so we need to but we need to analyze the whole rhetoric uh, process uh, to fully grasp uh, these. Because if you go on the social networks, the followers of Zemo identify themselves in the in a hem. They seem as a victim, as someone who's not allowed to say what he thinks. 
when we look at the laws, when, when and the impact, we, you know, you have people who have fantasies, portions uh, that are racist in a sense, but they know that it is a prohibited by law. When it, but then when they see people on primetime TV who utter these very words, they're very happy, they're uh, comforted in their uh, thinking, and this can lead to people taking uh, actions into their hands. Uh, I think it would be go a good idea for researchers to, I mean, they've already started working on this, but this, we will need to deep dive even further on this. Uh, so to, to come to my conclusions, I'd say that uh, as a researcher and as a citizen, is how can we respond to all of this? Uh, I think what I've observed is that when you uh, respond to with rational um, uh, arguments to Zimur, the speech, you will not change the belief of Zimur supporters or fans, but you need uh, nevertheless to do this work because around Zimur you have many journalists, uh, politicians, uh, commentators, observers, uh, and maybe we can try and convince them by or through arguments. There's also the emotional dimension, uh, as I mentioned earlier. I lately realized that to fight against racism and anti-Semitism, you need to engage to uh, methods uh, that uh, are part of the emotional uh, aspects. And uh, I worked a lot on uh, popular education with artists to um, put up shows when we can uh, combine the contribution of research with what artists can contribute, because artists know how to uh, touch emotions. Uh, and this is what we've been doing for about uh, 10 years in uh, popular uh, areas, in libraries, in um, theaters. Uh, uh, you can, um, you know, stage and um, such projects and our first project aimed at combating racism so we chose to present these uh, characters that everybody uh, forgot chocolat the clown and he was the, the first successful clown in france and he was a cuban slave who'd reached the shores of france uh, uh, by a whole set of uh, events and he became a great artist so i dedicated a book to uh, Shugara, and uh, um, we developed a, 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 a theater performance, uh, and then uh, it was then adapted to the, the big screen, uh, and l hence the movie Le Chocolat, or Chocolat, and um, uh, with uh, Omar Sy as the lead uh, role. So, what I'm trying to say is that we have to connect, we have to weave connections with people outside of our field of expertise, uh, as we will need their skills to uh, uh, come in to the public debate. Thank you very much for your attention.